here with us in the studio, Arsene Ostrovsky, international human rights lawyer. And joining us via our D.C. studio is Ford Fisher. He's editor-in-chief of the site News to Share and has been covering the events as they unfolded since Saturday. Ford, thanks very much for being with us. Thank you for having me. So I want to pull up some of the video footage that you shot during those moments on Saturday. And first, take us through a little bit of what you witnessed yourself. Yeah, so there were basically two sides that were separated by a barrier, but no police particularly separating them. So there was Lee Park, which was kind of a hill on which right-wingers uh, were congregating to talk and presumably give speeches. And outside of that park, there were left-wingers. Uh, but as the right-wingers were appearing, they would end up in fights with left-wingers on their way into the park. And before the park, uh, before the event had even started, the police ended up va evacuating the entire park, pushing everybody uh, out, which caused everybody to be in the same area, thus causing uh, even more brawls and even more fights and spreading the entire battle kind of throughout the city. What most shocked you in your reporting there? The most shocking thing was uh, certainly the, the car incident. So I was kind of around the corner uh, when the actual crash occurred. So I heard the crash but didn't see it with my own eyes, but I could hear people uh, screaming. And then as I ran over to it, I could see uh, very grisly injuries. People were uh, screaming for, for medics. And uh, sort of like the situation in Lee Park, where it was militia members and other private individuals trying to stand between and keep the peace, uh, initially it was mostly private individuals who were trying to administer CPR on the on the victim of the car accident as well as the other uh, the car crash I should say as well as the other 19 people who were injured people were trying to uh, perform medical services uh, before the police arrived and eventually when EMS got there they tried to take over the role of uh, performing CPR and we could see that they had given up and it was an hour later that the uh, government had confirmed that she had deceased in terms of the rally and the claims made there and the sign seen there, what kind of things did you hear from those protesters, those white supremacists, neo-Nazis? Did you hear them explicitly link what they were doing there to a sort of vision of President Donald Trump? Well, uh, on Saturday, there was very little actual ideology. It tended to just be a whole lot of fighting back and forth. But on Friday night, the night before the rally, I uh, had an opportunity to film at UVA, where many of the same individuals who participated on Saturday uh, were carrying torches with uh, lit flames around the campus. And they were chanting things like, uh, Jews will not replace us, uh, sort of hard anti-Semitism. And in one instance, I heard Jews will not replace us. And one person screamed, this is Trump's America now. And uh, so there was a clear tying together of Donald Trump uh, to some of the rhetoric among the right wing. Although I would note that many among the right wing uh, would go very much further than they see uh, Donald Trump. I think their, their, their opinion, or it, it seems to them, that Donald Trump has kind of moved the conversation in their direction. So even if they don't feel like he agrees with them, uh, they feel like he is uh, the, a step in their direction for the country. Ford Fisher in Washington, thanks very much for being with us and for sharing some of those images to see again what happened on Saturday. Arsen Ostrovsky here uh, with us. Arsen, you follow trends in anti-Semitism around the world frequently. And when we hear Ford describing what we have seen in images as well, what does it say to you? Do you feel like that there is some sort of uh, new stamp of approval for anti-Semitism in America as well? Look, when, uh, I think when, when Yad Vashem comes out and issues a very, very strongly worded condemnation about this, uh, about the horrific scenes we saw in Charlottesville, you get a small sense of the, just the sheer gravity of this matter. And I think there definitely is a trend in rising anti-Semitism over the, certainly over the last year since the election of President Trump. But even if you go back to ADL figures and FBI um, analysis and research, even in the years uh, on the year year or two at the end of President Obama's uh, presidency, and what you what you saw the other day in Charlottesville was pure, unadulterated, just sheer anti-Semitism from the hard right, neo-Nazis. But at the same time, you're also seeing anti-Semitism from the far left groups and the people like the Linda Sarsouras and some of the marchers and where you're seeing them, you know, the, there's no room for Zionists and Jews in LGBT protests. Well, let me ask you, when we see a thousand, over a thousand neo-Nazis, white supremacists, 
out in the streets in broad daylight in the United States. You mentioned that Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum mm -hmm. in Jerusalem, came out with a strong condemnation. Where was the condemnation from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu? That's a good question. Um, Naftali Bennett made a statement, so I right, think the that, right wing education um, minister. So that needs to be acknowledged. Um, but Netanyahu is the prime minister. He repeatedly uh, calls out anti Semitism around the world. The reality is he's in a very sensitive situation. I don't think he, certainly, I don't think he wants to be seen as if he's. Um, uh, criticizing and commenting what can be interpreted as a domestic um, policy within domestic actions within the United States and I certainly don't think he wants to be seen as openly criticizing President Trump and certainly not when the Trump administration is you know so far at least has not been uh, criticizing uh, Israeli policies. Uh, Although as Netanyahu the has never had a problem intervening too much in domestic policy in the past. He was very vocal in the last administration against Iran. He showed up to speak to Congress. So why not intervene now on an issue that should be pretty clear cut? It should be pretty clear cut, but I think when you get down to it, I don't think he wants to be seen as uh, criticizing, certainly not openly criticizing this administration uh, when uh, today it's seen as, you know, one of our best friends. Um, should he have uh, said something? There's certainly a lot of merit to that. But at the end of the day, I don't think he wanted to, to be seen as openly, um, you know, condemning the current administration for these actions. Briefly, Arfson, a, a big mm. question is going forward when you have this level of hatred of racism, of anti-Semitism exposed, how do you begin to actually turn this into something positive, to turn this into something healing in some way? It takes time, first of all. Um, I think we need unequivocal leadership. Um, we saw the difference in President Trump's statement immediately after the fact, and then just now. You know, the statement he gave just now really ought to have been the one he gave right after the fact. Um, one can say better late than never. It'll take time. It'll take a lot of education, but I think it'll, you know, our political leadership, certainly political leadership in the, in the United States, needs to be unequivocal against hate, whether it's from the left or the neo-Nazi far right, as we've seen here. Um, I think educational institutions need to um, be more active, um, certainly a great, um, great action against them by the government. Arsene Ostrovsky, thanks very much for being here. We're going out for a quick break. We'll be right back here on Debrief. Don't go anywhere.